afternoon, everybody. Um, welcome to your last session of the day. Thank you all for being here. Um, I told people before that if, it, if I wasn't presenting, I probably would have skipped the four o'clock session um, because it's been a really long day. And so thank you all for being here. My name is Ryan Flayhive. I'm the archivist at the Institute of American Indian Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, I teach uh, basics of archive method and an oral history class for museum studies. This is my colleague, Jesse Riker Crawford, Dr. Jesse Riker Crawford, newly minted. Just got that in December newly minted. So um, we wanted to do something very practical. One thing that I like about ATOM is this is the most practical skills-based conference that I'll go to all year long. Um, a lot of them are very theoretically based and ATOM is really focused on getting people skills. So today I'm going to go through a very rough overview over how to do basic care for your photographic collections. Photographs can pile up right? You can have thousands of them. Um, a lot of them can be unidentified. So getting a basic, you know, physical control of your collection is really the first step to establishing intellectual control with it. Uh, so we're going to go through a few things. Next, next slide. So a few objectives. Um, real quickly, we're going to go through uh, some identification of different photographic methods. So starting with the daguerreotype and moving all the way through tin types into uh, um, ambrotypes and then into even transparencies and things like that. We're going to talk about why photographs deteriorate, why films deteriorate, and then we're going to talk about how to stop or at least halt or slow down that deterioration. And that's not through treatment. That's going to be through your basic um, environmental standards and your environment, environmental conditions. And then we're going to talk about some general enclosures. And Gaylord Archival was kind enough to give us some supplies. And at the end of this, you're all welcome to come up and take some with you. Uh, some we only have five of, some we have 10 of, some we have 50 of. So please come on up and uh, at a minimum, come up and take a look at the part number so that when you go into the catalog online, you can, you can hunt them down. We're going to go through plastic and polyurethane uh, enclosures, and we're also going to go through some paper enclosures. Next slide. Um, I always like to start my presentations with a bibliography because I'm not the expert. These people are the experts. So the first place I suggest is Northeast Document Conservation Center, um, and they have a series of fantastic leaflets, and they've been around for decades, um, but they really go through these these very hands-on kinds. I think there's 50 or 60 different leaflets on their website, and they're very, very informative. Um, and I'm happy to email this presentation to anybody that wants it so you don't have to jot down these websites. Um, Marianne Ritzensaller's book. I didn't bring it along because it's giant, and I didn't want to carry it on the plane from New Mexico. Um, that is probably the number one book on photographic preservation. Um, I would highly suggest getting a copy for your stacks. Um, it's, it's excellent. It's giant and it takes up a lot of space, but it is good. The other one uh, is this book by Riley. And this book has been around for quite a long time. This is Care and Identification 19th Century Photographic Prints. Um, this explains each type of uh, photograph that you can find in, a, in an archive collection and how to care for it. So I'm going to pass this around. With that book comes this really nifty flow chart. And if you have photographs and you have 19th century photographs in your collection, I suggest you get the book and you get the flowchart, and everybody can be able to do it. So you can tell by pixelation and color, and it goes on a timeline to show you what is what as you're looking at it. Because, you know, the type can be hard to identify. Trying to identify a silver gelatin print from an amber print is, can be very difficult. So this helps you in terms of color and the different pixelation that happens with it. Um, so I'll pass these around. You're welcome to look at them. Next, please. OK, so we're going to do a really, really quick um, ID. Now, I think there was a, a session today by a retired still photographer. Did you attend that? How was it? Okay. All right. That's what 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 we're dealing with here is very time consuming. Trying to identify 19th century photographic uh, methods is not an easy task, and it's um, it's something that takes pretty much practice. So that's why I gave you the bibliography. 
because each one of you is going to have to eventually get into the book, compare it to that, and, and you know, with most everything else in our profession, you have to have that hands-on training in order to really, really see what you're doing and figure out what you're doing, and it takes a little bit of time to figure it out. But the resources are there. Um, I highly suggest the, the NEDCC um, uh, leaflets. They're really handy. So we can start with the heliotype and then daguerreotype. Daguerreotype is, you know, probably the most famous of of uh, 19th century images, the very famous image of Billy the Kid is a daguerreotype, um, and it's actually a mirrored image. Most of them are going to have uh, mirror face, positive, negative nature. It's really easy to flip them in reverse uh, because they are a mirror image. The next one. Salted paper prints. These are the first paper prints. Um, the, the way you can tell is that the matte surface usually fades to a yellow. Um, so it's really easy to um, uh, confuse these with the next one. Cy well, not the cyanotype. Cyanotype's a really cool blue one. Whoever has the flow chart, there's a, there's a blue type. And that was actually, um, the cyanotype was used mostly by amateur photographers. It was very easy to produce a cyanotype. But the salted prints, go to the next one. Yeah, wet collodion and planotype. So you can see these kind of fade or yellow. Um, and so you, it's, these paper prints, these early paper prints, are harder to identify than the um, metal-based uh, silver prints or the tin types um, or the other ones. Next. So here's a tin type. They're on iron. Um, has anyone seen Will Wilson's prints? Anybody familiar with Will Wilson's prints? He actually prints on aluminum. And I think he just had a feature in National Geographic just this last week, which is really cool. So he's been redoing these, these ferrotypes and tin types for a while. And you use, it's a nasty combination of chemicals that you dip, the, dip it in, and then you pull it out, and you put it in. And the classic, you've got to stay still for seven seconds where it blurs kind of thing. Um, these are really, they're fun, but they're hard to take care of. Uh, because you, they can scratch very, very easily. So uh, when we're looking at um, these kind of enclosures, it's really very few of these are going to be um, sufficient on their own. You usually have to put some tissue on them. You have to really buffer, buffer the edges to make sure that, that the um, image doesn't wear off. Amber types are usually, you can see this one's hand tinted. So hand-tinted photographs usually go through amber types. They're, they're made of glass. They usually have casings. Um, the black backings, they're milky. They don't quite have as much contrast as the others. Um, next. Carbon. So carbon-coated paper, there's two layers. And these, these, can be, these can easily separate. The carbon, the carbon prints, those two layers of paper, when they dry out, those two, those two layers separate. So you basically have the backing and the layer that has the image, and they will actually separate. And you see the large cracks that can develop in them. Um, this was what they used for image relief. And you can see the fibers. If you go into the flow chart, and you can see the fibers in them, that's how, that's how you know it's a, it's a carbon print, um, is through the, the little, little fibers in it. Calotypes. You're not going to find very many of these. They're very, very waxy. They almost feel like wax paper um, when, when you touch them. Once again, you can see paper fibers, uh, and you can usually see the, the outside edges of them. Most collections will not have these, but they're, you know, if you come across stuff you can't identify, I would highly suggest contacting any DCC or even Kodak. Kodak Eastman Museum in New York is very, very receptive to taking on images, taking you know, close-ups, so you can send them that and have them identified. So I'd definitely keep Kodak um, in your Rolodex if people still have Rolodexes. Go ahead. All right, glass plate negatives. Um, who has negatives? Who has glass plate negatives in their collection? Glass plate negatives. Anybody else have glass plate negatives in their collection? All right. So, yeah. How do you take care of them? How do you store them? Um, huh. Well, we have a lot of um, photographic material that we keep in cool storage in, in enclosures. Uh -huh. um, but I don't know all the specifics. Okay. Um, what's What's important to note about these is that they will they will flake. 
they will flake if you store them, like stack them. I usually will put them into a, into a sleeve that's about this size. They make, um, they'll make sleeves specifically made for uh, glass plates. You want them to be vertical if possible and you want them to be stored rigidly. Um, I, my last museum in Arizona, I actually had specific boxes made for them that had slots in them. And you can actually buy those. They, they have those that you can buy. I got mine custom because I needed them to fit my shelves perfect. I had, I don't know, five, six hundred glass plate negatives that I had to take care of. Um, there's somewhat of a controversy on whether or not we need to keep them. You know, because you can make, you can make an, a duplication on film and you can also make the prints. So whether or not you have the space to store glass plate negatives is going to be up to you. And that's kind of a, a selection and appraisal issue on whether or not your museum wants to care for glass plate negatives when it might not be necessary to care for the actual artifact. Because you can make a film copy of it. And then, you know, we have to consider all of our resources. We have to consider our space, our overhead, our air conditioning. We have to consider all of that before we decide to take something in. So if you have a donor come in and offer you 500 glass plate negatives and you know that you can only fit 10 in one box and that's a full cubic feet and you have 100 cubic feet of storage total, you're taking up a good portion of your storage through storing those 500. So these kind of space considerations are really important. Um, there's two kinds, there's a wet plate and there's a dry plate. Dry plate's gonna be um, quite a bit more uh, common. And you can see they're, they're in negative form. Um, they come in mostly eight by tens. You won't find too many uh, four by five glass plates. Most of them are going to be in eight by 10 format. Okay, let's talk about negatives for a minute. Film negatives, who's dealt with nitrate negatives? Anybody? Have anybody ever heard horror stories? of nitrate negatives? Yeah, they're really flammable. Really flammable. I did um, Western Archives Institute about 12 years ago. And they did this thing where they took, a, they took a nitrate negative that they didn't want anymore and they lit it on fire. And it burned for like three hours. And just these blue flames, just, it just, and they can spontaneously combust. If you were to take it out in the Sonoran Desert, and drop it in the desert, it might literally light on fire by itself. Now, the way you know you have a nitrate negative is called vinegar syndrome. If you walk in to your storage and you open up a box and you get this pungent smell, and you'll, you'll feel it, it'll actually probably give you a rash. Um, they're nasty, nasty things. So you really have to be careful with nitrate negatives. You can see down here, you can see the coating. And if you go into that book, um, and certainly Rittenthaler's book too, they have full uh, sections on how to identify what type of negative you have, mostly through the writing and these notches. You can see the different notches. This is safety film and this is nitrate film. Now, Kodak Eastman didn't make, they didn't have a proprietary product, so more than one company made nitrate negative film, which means their markings are gonna be different. So before you start handling you know, early 20th century uh, negatives, I really suggest that you, you get into the book, you check out the markings, you check out the notches, and you make sure you know what you have. Um, polyester film is going to be the safety film, roll negatives, color negatives. Color negatives are, are, are interesting. Um, you're not gonna find them very often. Most of the time, you're only gonna have them in, uh, um, in you know, rolled film. The two I really want you to, to try to focus on, nitrate. Nitrate can be, I mean, if you have cold storage, put them in cold storage, most certainly. Absolutely, you, you wanna freeze them. And a lot of places don't even keep them. They digitize them, they print them, and they destroy the nitrate because they are a hazard. Um, I've been doing the risk management certificate, Nitrate negatives are a major risk in your archives for a fire if you, if you have the wrong conditions. Um, next. Transparencies. Who has thousands of slides? Thousands of slides. Everybody made slides. And just like the three by five uh, photographs that we you know, made in the 80s, we always did them in duplicate, right? Which means we have even more. Um, 
Slides are very easy to take care of because we can use binder pages. You know, you can use easy binder pages, slide it in, I think they hold what, 20, 15, 20 each. Put them in, they're pretty easy. The hardest part is that most of them are unidentified. So something that I'm gonna mention later is that there isn't as much value in an unidentified image as an identified image. If you're running out of space and you have limited resources, I really suggest that you look at unidentified photographs as something you might be able to deaccession, depending on its content. Um, yes, ma'am. Crazy question. Mm -hmm. How, where could I get these made into a regular print? Where you can get them made into regular print? Yeah. Uh, scan them and print them. Just scan them little, and they'll just. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Scan, yeah. scan them. At, I do. I do all of my slides at twelve, uh, twelve to twenty-four hundred DPI, depending on twelve hundred minimum. 2400, if I can maximize um, my DPI and my resolution on that. The biggest problem with transparencies is that they scratch very, very easily. Even slides that were made 10 years ago could be yellowed and they could be scratched. Um, museums use a lot of slides or used a lot of slides to document their, their objects. A lot of art historians, you know, they have those, they have those as well. They might not be usable. Um, so I would certainly keep an eye out for scratches and keep an eye out for dirt. They collect dirt, they're magnetic. They, they collect all the dirt. So before you scan them, make sure you take a Japanese brush and you brush them really well or even use canned air because there's, there's, uh, there's a whole bunch of dirt that builds up in these seams where they put the casing. And that will show up on the image. And it actually can, uh, yeah. When you also choose a scanner, um, there are those who are made that are made specifically for um, uh, the transparencies because you want a white background and some of those, they have the black top, it's not going to work. So do make sure that the scanner that you use is built to have a transparency like addition to it or that mm -hmm. it's made for that. Yeah, so the, the scanner I've been using is a Epson Perfection 750 Pro. They just released a, a, a V850 Pro, and that allows you to, you know, a flatbed scanner, you have the scanner and you have the hood, right? And you close the hood up and down. The hood has a pad, and you can pull the pad out, and there's actually a light in the lid that can do a transparency. So when you're buying a scanner, don't skimp out, but spend the extra couple hundred bucks and get a scanner that can do transparencies. You'll, you'll, you'll thank yourself later, because you want to be able to scan, scan 35 millimeter um, as much as possible. Can I ask a question, Ryan? Yeah. So we had an issue where um, transparencies, it was very important because they were cultural, that there was a right side and a wrong side. Is there a way to tell on these which way is the right side and wrong side? So we had pictures of kivas that were opposite, which was incorrect. And so it's very important. Yeah, yeah, like this 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 lantern slide right here, it could be a reverse image. That that could that could be reversed. The thing about slides is that there is on if anybody's ever read like the embossed writing on the back of a slide, it says this site up. That only matters if the person who put it in the casing actually did it the right way. That's not always the case. So you're, they're supposed to be a front and a back. Now, the best way to tell what is the front and what is the back is by looking for the emulsion. Okay, you're going to look for the emulsion. The matte side, and you can usually find a glare. If you can find a glare, that's going to be, that's going to be the front. And then the emulsion side is going to be more of a like grayish matte finish, and you'll be able to see that on there. Um, and that's going to be the side that you put down to make sure you get it right. And there's, yeah. What's that? No, the back side's matte. Front side is the, is the glossy. Oh, okay. Yeah, but you want to put the front down. You want to put the front side down so the matte side is up. <laughs> Confusing you, aren't I? Yeah. All right. Um, lantern slides. Lantern slides were used in schools a lot. So there's a lot of commercial lantern slides out there. Lantern slide connections are usually 4x5s. Um, they don't usually come much bigger than 4x5. Uh, and they're, you know, most of the time, they aren't original, they aren't unique. There's sets of them that were commercially sold to schools, and they were used pretty much like slides or what we're using as PowerPoint. It was really the first PowerPoint technology with lantern slides. Um, 
So those are, you're going you're gonna to find some of those, but those have the same kinds of issues that glass plate negative does, which is that it has to be stored rigidly, they can scratch, and they take up a lot of space. So, um, and the casings are, casings can be really, they can be wooden and really ornate. They're pretty cool objects in and of themselves. If you're doing, doing something on photographic technology, lantern slides are a lot of fun. That answer your question about the front and the back and the reverse? No, it's been, it's been thought forever that the Billy the Kid image is reversed that has never really been shown the way it's supposed to be. And nobody knows, because there's no identification on it. Um, I always look for words, always try to look for words on, on the image to see which way is, which way is right. Um, Autochrome kind of kind of came in the middle, and they're going to be they're going to be a film type of slide, a little bigger than a 35 millimeter. I haven't seen very many of them, um, but they are around. All right, film deterioration. Uh, you can see some of the deterioration up here. When they start to deteriorate, you see the yellow and you see the mirroring. You start to see a glare on them. That's the first thing you see. So if you get a collection um, of film that's brought in and transparencies that are brought in and you see them yellowing, that means that you probably need to get them in cold storage as soon as possible to stop that deterioration. Then you need to reformat them. Reformatting is really the only way to save these because deterioration is going to happen. We know that with paper. We know that with almost everything. It wants to go away eventually. We're just trying to retard the deterioration as much as we can so that we can reformat it. Um, if they start to get to this place, they start to feel sticky. When they start to stick, they will stick to other negatives. They will stick to other transparencies and then you start to lose images and you don't want to lose the image before you get them reformatted. Um, a lot of these will be stored in glassine sleeves. Everyone ever seen a glassine sleeve? Kind of brown, kind of waxy. They were used for, I don't know, 60, 70 years to protect these. They will actually stick to the glassine and they will smell awful. Um, when it starts to get more of an amber color and you can see right here, you know, before it gets yellow and you start to lose everything, um, You've got a major issue and need to reformat as soon as possible. So identifying these, and this is primarily, I mean, I would, just, I would assume most of us know what's in our collection. These, these are things you need to look for when incoming donations come to your shop. And you really need to take note on the condition they're in because if you take in, if it's an important collection, it gets prioritized right now. It goes in front of everything. The reformatting becomes one of your top priorities then especially if it's important to your mission. Um, level five is when everything starts to stick. Everything sticks together. And lastly, it just turns into powder. It just turns into powder. And in, in really humid areas, this is, this is what's going to happen. Um, if you leave it in a shed and you have this really high fluctuation of temperature and humidity, they will just absolutely disintegrate into nothing. So film, film is quite a bit more difficult to care for than photographs because you can't write on film. So even the identification of them are difficult and more difficult than the rest. All right, so let's talk about general care of photographs. Does anybody have any questions on anything that I've covered so far? Okay, yes ma'am. Oh, they quit making it in the 40s. People were still using it into the 50s. Um, if you have stuff that's like 1900 and 1930, it's probably, probably nitrate. Yeah, we have um, some things that are from the 1950s. Yeah, yeah, I would, I would definitely check the markings. Okay. You know, if it says safety, you're good. But really, the vinegar syndrome smell is the first, the first thing you'll notice. I mean, you open the box, and you know, I suggest you have your respirators. You know, if, if, you, have, if you have a set of old, old uh, negatives, keep your respirators around and use gloves, because it will, that, that stuff will seep into your skin, and you will get a rash. Um, I, had a, I had a really cool collection of nitrate negatives from the 1904 World's Fair in St. Louis. They were awesome. It was like 300 images taken by a family. And it was when they built the St. Louis Art Museum and the zoo and everything. 
And as I'm going through them, all of a sudden, I break out in a giant rash, and I had to go to the hospital. And it was bad. I had to go in like antibiotics and stuff. It was awful, and it was all from nitrate. So the first thing we did is we got them into cold storage. I recovered, came back, scanned them all, and then we destroyed them. And then we just took them out and, and got rid of them, and you know, we, we made sure that they weren't going to bother anybody else. Um, all right, so let's talk real generally about photographs. You need to know generally how many negatives and prints you have, and slides. And that's really hard, because you could have, you know, as opposed to a museum where you might have, you know, five objects on a shelf, you might have a box of photographs with 5,000 photographs in it, you know, with 4,800 of them not identified, you know. Uh, so how many are negative, how many are nitrate, how many are acetate, how many are polyester, how many are black and white, how many are color? Get a general sense. The survey is really important. Um, probably the best book on surveys that I've read that's easy to follow is Gregory Hunter's Developing and Maintaining Practical Archives. It's a big yellow, yellow uh, um, book, but it talks about surveys in general on what you need to look for. Surveys are really important in order to determine your, your preservation needs and your arrangement needs that then can be turned into something like a grant. Because you need to prioritize what you have. How many photo albums? Who's taking care of photo albums? Who has lots of photo albums? Anybody have those ones from the 70s with the magnetic? And <laughs> what a mess. <laughs> what a mess. And then you have the ones from like the 40s and 50s that are on the black cardboard, the black paper. Yeah. And then the, you see the black. Yeah. Oh my goodness. What a mess. Um, Photo albums and scrapbooks might be the most infuriating thing any archivist has to deal with. Uh, I suggest, if you have them, to digitize them with a, with a copy stand and a camera. And take large images of the whole page that you can then go in and crop the individual images out of the photograph. Don't try to dissemble the photograph. Don't try to take everything apart. Um, I've known archivists who take their little micro spatula and they go underneath the, each one on the black, and that's just a waste of time. You know, you can actually go in with a DSL camera, take the image at you know 1,200, 2,400 DPI, and you might consult with somebody to see what what resolution do you have to shoot in in order to make sure you get a constant 300 DPI on the smallest point. Because that's really what you need for any publication quality is 300 DPI minimum. So if, we're, if I have an 11 by 17 photo album, what is the max resolution I need for the whole thing so that I can get down to this 2 by 3 photograph to be 300 DPI? And so there's, there's people out there that can help you do that. What needs the most attention? I've talked about prioritization a lot. It's really important to prioritize your collection and to prioritize your preservation and treatment. Some things you might not want to treat on your own. Reformatting, I suggest you can, you can always do on your own, um, whether or not to use a camera or a scanner. What needs to be printed for access? If you, only, if you have a collection that's only negatives, only negatives, and you need access to prints, because most people want prints. Right? They, don't, they don't want the negative. Um, what needs to be done for access? Because people want to see the, they can't really get a whole lot of information off a negative. So what needs to be printed for access? What's most important to your collection policy? All right, your collection policy is the top rung of your prioritization. If it doesn't fit your collection policy, you need to rethink why you have it. All right, and hopefully we're using what we call collaborative collecting practice rather than competitive collecting practice. We don't want to overlap our collections with other people in the area. Like in Santa Fe, how many, how many native museums do we have? At least five. Yeah, mm -hmm. at least five. All right, we, we make sure that we're collecting contemporary, we're collecting history of the school, and we don't collect general native history like, say, Mayak would or School of Advanced Research would. So what is most important in terms of your collection policy? And of course, collection policy always has to support mission. Always has to support mission. So when we're looking at appraisal and arrangement, we really need to consider your collection policy. What's going to interest your researchers? As we all know, in archives, 
Nobody knows we have anything unless we tell them. That's the bottom line. We have to do better at, re at outreach. Our outreach has to be better. We have to tell people what they're interested in, more or less. And that comes down to our collection policy. So as we get through our collection policy, we identify who our, who our constituents are. Who are our users? Is it our community? Is it, uh, is it publishers? Uh, is it magazines, newspapers? Who is our main researcher, and what are they interested in? You know, what's interesting? And we all know what's interesting, right? But remember, interesting doesn't necessarily always conform to your collection policy. So it has to go hand in hand. And as I mentioned before, unidentified images are far less valuable than identified images. Now, there are ways to identify images through crowdsourcing, and they can actually be really fun. Like you get out you know, a handful of photo albums or scrapbooks that are, you have absolutely no idea what the provenance is. There's no names on them. So you get them out, you put them on a table, and you serve some punch and some cookies, and you invite your community in to try to identify some of this stuff. It's tedious, it's time consuming, but it engages your community probably more than any other activity you can do. Um, so trying to crowdsource identification can be a really, can be a really good thing for your shop. It can identify new donors, identify new uh, stakeholders, um, you know, you're, you're able to get people in really more collections because once they see, oh, they're caring for this and they're trying to do their best to identify things, I have, you know, 15, 15 scrapbooks from grandma in the garage that I need to do something with. So certainly try to identify what you can. But if they're not identified, you know, you might, you might rethink why you, why you have them or if you need to keep them. Um, and reformatting can really help that, because if you have a digital copy of an unidentified image, at least you have something to then show to people um, if, if, if you choose to do that through your policy. I have a question. Yeah. For uh, negatives, how would you uh, reproduce them? Like you can't, if they're older negatives, you can't really send them out to the local Walmart. So how do you reproduce those as positive images? The way I do them is the same scanner that has the flip up with the light in the lid, they'll handle a four by five negative. And they'll also have negative strip holders. So they'll be like, uh, the, the 750 Pro has a series of these things that click into it. One's for 35 millimeter slides, one's for negative strips, another one's for four by five negatives. And you just scan them, and then you can print them out, or you can send those images somewhere like a Walgreens or another photo lab to do it. There are still photo labs out there that will do darkroom work. My last job in Arizona, I actually had a darkroom and a darkroom tech, which was really, really cool to have a darkroom. Um, so we were able to take all of our glass plate negatives, for example, and make actual print out of the glass plate negatives so that we could put the other ones into, into a deep storage um, so that they didn't take up our, our main, main source. So the best way to do that is to scan them, scan them in a high resolution, and then print them out. You know, I suggest doing an eight by 10, pick out some good paper, don't do them on your laser jet, have somebody, have, have a good print shop do it. It can be very, very costly to do that. But if it's a preservation issue, there's a lot of grants out there. Um, Real quick plug for your state historic preservation, historic records preservation boards. Um, every state re-grants NHPRC money, which is National Historic Publications and Records Commission. They, they give money to each state, and there's a board in each state that then re-grants for these kinds of things. Um, in New Mexico, it's $8,500 with like a 25% match. That could easily do you know, they could easily be able to um, reproduce a bunch of negatives or a bunch of photographs and reformat them. So those little kinds of projects, look into your national, your state historic preservation board. Um, everybody has them. They're usually within a state archives. So go to your state archives. Uh, actually, ours is within the, I think the office of the state historian, which is located in the state archives. So look into it. They're, they're kind of buried, they're kind of obscure, but there are these small little local grants. And I'm not a, I'm not a guy that likes to write big grants at the NEH and the IMLS. I want to stay local, if at all possible. I want to make sure that the people who are running my grant agency are close, that they're easily accessible. So look for those little grants. And you can take care of some of these issues. And generally speaking, 
The smaller and more focused the project, the greater chance you have of being awarded. Larger you get, the harder it is. All right, let's talk about the environment. Um, 68 degrees, 20 to 40% humidity. Uh, yesterday we were at Milox and they were talking about um, the fluctuation that can happen between their humidity, whether it's going to be, you know, get down. If they dehumidify it and then they unplug the dehumidifiers, and in, in New Mexico we don't have to use dehumidifiers. We have to put a lot of water in the air just to maintain 36%. Um, now, recently they have come out and said that 68 degrees isn't as important as it was, say, 10 years ago. That you can actually have maybe a 10 or 12 degree fluctuation. The biggest problem is major fluctuation. I was talking to, who was that? Talking to somebody today who's from Oklahoma and her museum flooded four years ago. Flooded from a water main. And they said when they were trying to get the room back into shape, they had fluctuations between 12% and 75%. And that caused mold, that caused major cracking in the emulsion. Um, so if you can only do 72 degrees in your shop, try to keep it as close to 72 as you can. If you can, you know, if you can only do 40% or you can only do 20% relative humidity, try to maintain it. The biggest detriment to it is that huge fluctuation. You need just a stable environment, whatever you can afford to do. Not everybody can afford a good HVAC that can keep 68 and 36%. You know, it's just not, not capable for everybody. Um, light levels, I hate fluorescent lights, can't stand them, um, but it's what we have. Yesterday I liked the Milox. Milox had these uh, upward facing kind of bowls that held the lights. So all the light was going up off the, off the ceiling and then shining down. So you actually had a reflection. So the Lux was actually, you know, pretty, it was right around, I think 65 is what they told me. Um, so watch out for your light levels and most certainly keep it in dark storage. And that's why we're gonna show you the paper enclosures today. And that's why we use Hollinger boxes. You know, the darker, the better, right? We want to make sure that we keep light off of the uh, emulsion as much as possible. And as we all know, keep food and drink, dirt and chemicals and photocopy stuff away from storage areas. You know, we should, we should know that. Filter the air. We really need to keep an eye on our filters, especially if you live in a heavily humidified area where those particulates are heavier and they stick into your filters. Every six months, maybe even every quarter, you wanna go in and check your filters to make sure that they're properly working to keep biological agents out and to make sure that the air circulation is working. Cold storage is a luxury. Not everybody can afford to have cold storage. Not everybody can afford to even buy a little freezer. You know, just a little, little freezer we'd put our elk meat in or something. Um, only after reformatting, because we don't want to put it in cold storage, pull it out, put it in cold storage, pull it out, reformat it, put it away, be done with it, just leave it there. And that's only if you choose to keep it. You know, because we talked about nitrates, we talked about glass plates. If you don't have the resources to keep them, you should consider, you know, just keeping the reformatted pieces. Ziploc bags are going to be key to keep the freezer burn off of them. So if you're going to put anything in cold storage, certainly use freezer bags. Where is that giant freezer bag? Susan, Susan Feller gave me this giant freezer bag today for all these supplies. That thing. This is a really fantastic bag. I have no idea where she got it, but this is a really great idea, especially if you have like eight by 10 glass plates um, to be able to, you know, make these rigid, maybe put some, maybe put some board in there, maybe some, uh, you know, foam core to keep it stable. And then you can load this thing full. And then you want to make sure you suck out all the air and vacuum seal it as much as possible. Make sure that, that uh, cold air doesn't get to the emulsion. Glass and metal, if you have, if you have daguerreotypes or tin types that have cases, don't put the cases in. All right, you find, find a conservator that can take the image out of the, uh, out of the case and do that. Glass originals, retrieve originals in case of emergency. That's pretty much what we want. And before you open that, bring it to room temperature. 
right? Because that, that shock of warm air will actually create you know, a fog, more or less, and that will create condensation on the emulsion. So try to, try to get everything up to room temperature beforehand. Oh, vertically. Store them, uh, store them all vertically. If you, if you have big prints, get those giant flat boxes um, that we store big prints in. Those are nice. But generally speaking, we want to store things vertically. All right, we want, we want to use Hollinger cases, you know, the flip top, flip top boxes. Big thing is don't, uh, I think I have it here. Overfill and underfill. All right, if you only have, if you only have, say, four folders, and that's all that's going into that box, find a way to create a spacer. You can actually buy spacers. So you need to space them, because if they don't, then those folders will curve, and the images will also curve. Now, the same thing happens with overfilling. Then all, everything's all squished together, and there's a chance that that emulsion might actually stick to the enclosure. Okay. No more than one image per, per enclosure unless you're using a buffer. Okay, so with these here, which is, I use a lot of these. Most of my stuff, the, the job I'm at now is 1950s to present, so I don't have a whole lot of these issues. But I like these. You know, I, I, I like binder pages because they're cheap, they're easy, and you can see through them. And so it limits the need for gloves with patrons. Um, and what I like to do is I put them back to back and I put a piece of cotton bond uh, buffered paper, pH buffered paper in between, I'm good to go. So uh, invest, in, invest in some good cotton bond paper, uh, just a few reams of it. Ryan, um, 25 pound cotton bond paper. Is, yeah. uh, so you're saying uh, buffered paper which will keep the pH balance neutral. Um, is there any of these materials where you would want non-buffered because they aren't acidic? Yes. Yes, and, we, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about that when we get to the enclosures. Because some of these are buffered and some of them are not buffered. Um, label copies on the reverse in pencil. Okay, it's okay to write on the back of your print in pencil. Now there are some, I wonder if I even brought that pen. Uh, there's a German pen, because you know some of the prints have a really waxy backside and pencil doesn't mark on them. So there's a special pen, it's a German pen, that will, that's made to write on the back of, of photographs. Um, it's like a maroon colored uh, marker. You can find it, find it at Gaylord, find it at Talis, find it at Hollinger. Um, they will have them. I suggest you have both of them. I don't use ink unless I'm like signing something. Otherwise, it's pencil. So I, I suggest getting one of those pens or a couple pens. You're not going to use them very often. Um, but especially anything that was printed in like the 70s or 80s, those prints are going to be really tough to write on in pencil. You'll actually damage it from pressing down on it so hard to get your, to get your image. Um, produce copies for research, copy production, and exhibits. Don't ever put your originals on exhibit. Don't, don't do it. Resist. Resist the urge to put your original photographs on exhibit. So copies are great. You know, lots of copies keep stuff safe. That is, that is the, the, that's what we know. That's about all we know is we need redundancy. And that's for digital and that's for our copies. It's best if you have a really heavily accessed collection, make duplicates and give them the duplicates. They can get the same information off of, an, off of a duplicate as they can from the original. So if you have a large collection that's heavily used, I had a CS Fly collection of Geronimo's Capture at my last job. Those were used all the time. We had three different access copies. Originals never came out. We had them in glass plate and we had original prints. Um, and so really, really tried to, mean, to keep that off of there. Um, let's see, what's next? Uh, compress, leaning, <sighs> typo. Rubber bands, paper clips, and adhesives. Oftentimes you will find 35 millimeters wrapped up in a rubber band, right? Or you'll, you'll find the, the three by five prints, you know, in a rubber band. That rubber band has probably dried, probably stuck to the emulsion. Now you have a line down, down the top photo. Try to take those off as best you can. Um, and you'd buffer sleeves for most negatives, prints, and slides. Not all of them. We'll go to the next slide and we'll see. That's there. Okay, buffered paper. 
Buffered paper is going to be pH 7.5 to 9.5. Ritzenthaler's book does a really, really fantastic job of explaining the science behind the pH levels and the acidity. Um, she knows a lot more than me, so I'm going to leave that to her. But please look at her, look at her book um, and learn the pH levels. In the end, your institution should come up with a list of supplies that are stock and standard that you're ordering every time. Very rarely should you deviate from that. So if you know that you need a, a buffered paper that has a, a, you know, an 8 pH level, buy it every time. Buy the same ones every time. That's really important. Color images, cyanotype, and albumin prints use unbuffered paper. So if you have any of these, colored images are going to be like hand-tinted images are going to need those. Um, any kind of early, you know, the early you know, 50s, 60s um, photographic prints that came out, those all need unbuffered paper, as do cyanotypes and albumin. Always look for the PAT tested on here. When you go into the Gaylord catalog, it will have, and I don't think any of these have it written on there, but when you look at the, um, the description of the supply, it will say PAT tested. Don't buy anything that doesn't say PAT tested. That means the experts have gone through and they know that it is good for photoactivity. So this is something that I added. I think that's what they do. This is not anything we have to do. We're just, so that's essentially what the PAT test is, is they're checking for chemicals in the enclosures and they're detecting uh, reactions between the, the, the gelatin and the, and the paper. Um, bottom line, choose enclosures that are acid-free, lignin-free, 100% rag, and not highly colored. I really like, these are the colored um, sleeves that I use for most of my negatives. And as you can see, they're, they're, they're mostly white. These are really simple. You can do most anything in these. If you have, uh, th these can hold film, these can hold slides, these can hold uh, small photographs. These are really great. I have a large collection of four by five negatives and this is what I use and there's boxes that these specifically fit in and they're, they're kind of fun. All right. All right, so types of paper enclosures. First we have seamed paper enclosures and that's going to be something like this, okay. Yeah, write on these with pencil. These take pencil really well, and you know you can erase pencil, which is great. Um, or you can just cross it out. And so these are these are great. I'll pass some of these around so you can look at them. And like I said before, you're welcome to come up and take what you like after everything. Um, four flap enclosures. Now I got they they gave me little ones. These are four flap enclosures, so these aren't seamless. But these will essentially fold up and you can get these in 8x10. You can probably even get them up into a 11x17 size. But these, the, they're really nice because they, they don't apply as much pressure to the image as a seamed enclosure. Okay, so these are the four flaps. If you wanted to, you could, you could buy this paper in bulk and make your own. You could absolutely do that if you didn't want to, because as we all know with, with most everything we buy, you pay for the work that goes into the, into the supply. Yes, ma'am? This is a four flap enclosure. Um, this is going to be, I think, a pH buffered paper of probably around eight. So you just check with check and check in Gaylord, um, and I think you can actually buy this paper. If you can't buy it from Gaylord, I would check a place called Talus in in New York City. They sell a lot of specialty conservation supplies. Um, great place to get specialty papers like uh, Japanese tissue uh, for you know paper tears and stuff like that. So four four flap enclosures are they're pretty nifty. They're, they require a little more work than the seamed ones, um, but they are quite a bit more, more flexible. Paper folders. Where are the paper folders? Let's 
So this is just a, a basic paper folder. This is going to be very similar to the document folders that you get for you know, your Hollinger boxes, um, except they're made for photographs. So this is going to have the correct pH balance. Um, and these are going to be really nice. What, what they suggest doing is actually doubling it up with one of these. So you can see in here, we have the paper folder, and then we have an enclosure like that inside. So that when you open it, you don't have to touch the image. So these are really nice. They're not cheap, but these are really nice. If you have a heavily used collection, I really suggest getting, getting a bunch of these. These are really nice. Yeah, pass these around. Those. Um, these, are these are viewing folders, so the ones with the, with the polyurethane. Um, these are called viewing folders, and these are just print folders. Advantages of paper enclosures, of course, we like dark, right? We like dark. So we want to make sure that everything's dark. They're porous. They keep, um, they, they will actually create a layer of protection, um, whereas plastic you know, it can go into the seam. The paper will actually absorb any moisture that gets on there. Um, they're less expensive. Yeah. Um, they're less expensive than plastic. You know, the plastic and polyurethane is going to be more expensive, and those are easy to write on. If anybody's ever tried to write on a plastic enclosure, you know you have to have one of those special pens, all right? One of those special German pens. Disadvantages makes viewing difficult. And if viewing is difficult, that means it makes more handling. And so, you know, the, the, common, the common thing right now is that the only time we really ever have to use cotton gloves is when we're handling stuff with emulsion. Because, you know, regular paper will actually take the, take the skin off of our fingers and kind of just absorb it, and you can't really tell a difference. But over time, the oil on your fingers will eat through photographic emulsion. So we want to uh, really cut down on the handling. All right. Maybe made, so plastic enclosures. And polyester is going to be the, the one that's used the most. Polyure, polypropylene and polyurethane are going to be the other ones. Do not look for the PVC, and you, and you won't find those in the, uh, um, in the catalogs at all. You're going to find polyester and polypropylene. The difference is going to be price. And they're usually going to come in different thicknesses two, three, four, five millimeter usually. Five millimeter is going to be the heaviest, and those are going to be the most expensive. Um, two millimeter is going to be just fine. So it's going, to be, it's going to be fine. Thank you very much. All right, let's go, let's go. All right, one more. Don't forget, don't forget some enclosures. Um, all right, so plastic envelopes. These are heat sealed. There are seamed. <coughs> These are the seamed polyurethane and, or polyester enclosures. So they just have one seam compared to the L-lock. So you can see this L-lock here. It has a kind of self-locking edge there. It crosses over. So depending on your budget, depending on what you want, um, I'll just pass those around. Those are the two that are, are um, most used aside from, oh, I just had one out, these here. I mean. These sleeves, these are money. These are what you want for most things. You, you should be able to use these. I mean, I use these for everything from documents to photographs uh, to transparencies. You can use a lot of these. You can put them in a nice binder. Yeah. And it kind of matters. Don't get those at the dollar store. Right. And a lot of times if you smell it and you have a strong chemical smell, you know that it's breaking down. Um, they have archival quality yeah. sleeves. Sea line. I buy, I buy the C-Line enclosures, and these are what, these are, what are sold by, um, by Gaylord. There's actually a, yeah, a number on there. Most of the time it's, yeah. it's inert, um, but you don't know. So it's better yeah. to get it from an archival store just to make sure, because they're going to guarantee it. Yeah, and then there's... there's uh, these here that are just kind of, they're, they're kind of opaque. 
they're kind of like the other one, except they just kind of slide in. They're like these. They're exactly like these, except they're made out of the polyester. So these are really handy. And the, the, the real advantage to using plastic is visibility. You can, people can see them, especially if you have a bunch of binder pages and you have, you know, because they make binder boxes. You don't want to use a plastic binder. You want to use a good supported uh, binder that has good uh, paper support and, and clearance. But if you have a full album, you know, you just give them the box. You don't have to give them gloves because they can just thumb through it. They can just go through it. Now, the way, to, the way I like to mark those are with little stickers. I like little stickers to identify on my plastic. I don't like to write on them because I might need to reuse them if for a different purpose. You know, if for some reason I need to take it out and reuse that sleeve for something else. So yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That, yeah, that, that, that adhesive is not going to make its way through. It's not going to eat through the plastic. And Gaylord Brothers has those binders with the, the D-rings D um, on display right now. They're really fabulous. Yeah, yeah they're, they're really nice, I suggest. They're, they're not cheap, um, but if you insist on using three-ring binders, which I do, um, because they're just so easy for my researchers, and it's much easier for me, and if I had a staff, easier for my staff um, to provide access to them. Um, polyester encapsulation. Let's go back right here. Polyester encapsulation. Has anybody ever encapsulated a map? No? All right. So you can buy this material in large sheets, large rolls. And so people either heat weld them or they use double-sided tape. The double-sided tape has kind of gone passe in the last 10 years, and now they use a heat welder. So if, you're go if you have large maps, because they don't make enclosures for huge maps. I had a collection of you know, six foot long by three foot wide railroad maps that needed custom enclosures. And so we, we used a heat welder and went all the way around the outside and that closed it down. The heavier the polyester, the better. Get the four or five millimeter, not the two millimeter. Otherwise, it's really, really hard to work with because it's really flimsy and it's not rigid enough to work with. What else we have? Ring binder storage pages, got that. Um, polyester sheet mat board folder, that's going to be the, it's gonna be these. So this actually goes into both categories. And polyester sheet with a paper folder. Um, the same thing, same thing. All right, where are we at with time? Five o'clock. <laughs> Five o'clock. Um, yeah, we talked about that. Let's go to the next one. We got formatting. It's important to reformat your stuff. Formatting could mean digitization. It could mean making prints. It could mean um, just making uh, another copy. Um, have a good preservation online. Please know you shouldn't digitize anything unless you're collecting metadata at the same time. Keep your metadata if you're going to digitize anything. Don't just digitize everything and give it 001, 002, because then the next project you do that has 001 and 002, everything's going to be jumbled. So maintain your metadata really well. Um, standard file format, create everything in TIFFs. Access should be JPEG. Okay? And for me, digitization is not preservation. Digitization is an access standard. Digitization is not preservation. They are two different things. Okay, and like I said, Loxus, lots of copies keep stuff safe. That's the best strategy we have so far for our digital stuff is just redundancy. We don't have a better strategy than to just make extra copies and extra backups. Okay, so if you're going to digitize stuff, make lots of copies. Be very overly redundant and uh, everything should work out. Do you have anything to add? Thank you for signing me up for this. Appreciate yeah. that. All right. Thank you.